on the ground and we got our tension and completed. Now the next step is to ground. So uh, we need to look up. We got some uh, resources for grounding. There should be a special provision in your contract. Uh, there's a section in the special uh, in the 2012 specs, section 430 talks about it. You've got some notes on your plans. Uh, <coughs> construction manual. You've got some information on there. Uh, I want to remind everybody also, I'm not going to show the video uh, like Aaron just showed you a video on DTI. That same location on the communication DOT website. We've got uh, a grouting video, and we've also got a video there on setting slabs. So if you don't do this in a while and you need to come back and look at it, you can go back and use that resource later. The grouting materials that we use, there's going to be prepackaged grout. Uh, <clears throat> we're looking for a grout that gets 5,000 PSI in three days. So how do we know what's approved? Exactly. The M&T approved products list. Uh, this now I want to remind everybody: don't go back to this presentation and use this chart, this table. It changes, it varies. I pulled this off in December. There could be additional ones on there. There could be some dropped off. Always go to that M&T website to get the most current list. Um, one thing I do want to bring everybody's attention to: if anybody noticed a change here in the last several months, but. Um, Matter of fact, prior to December, I pulled this off and then went back and it changed. But the category type, used to, and our product group here, used to, we just had a category of non shrink grouts. There'd be a ton of, I mean, items. You can see how there's just a few here. Well, MT has since went back, wrote a new special provision for grouts. Uh, they're in the back of your handout if you've downloaded them. I put a couple of those uh, special provisions that are current right now in there. So you can go back and read them if you've not been on one of these or don't have plans available. But the they've broken the grouts into five types now. The type three is what we're looking for for uh, cord slabs and box beams for grouting these keyways. Um, so keep that in mind. And you may, you may occasionally find one that's not on the type three list. Because some of them will, will be in multiple categories. So uh, just keep that in mind that, that when you look for these, you know, you may have used something all the time. It's a type 2 now. That's not saying it can't be used as a course lab. We just need to make sure it meets the right, the right specs at 5,000 in uh, three days. But <clears throat> just because it's on this list, does it mean we can use it for uh, course lab, box beam, grouting, keyways, and downhole? Mm -hmm. That's yeah. correct. It, the, just because it's on the list, it may be approved for a different application. Or it may not, uh, yes, it's an approved non shrink grout. It may not meet that 5,000 in three days. So just because it's on the list, we still need to go and get the manufacturer's specs on it to see what strength it has. Typically, in the field, when you see this information come out, the bag will have mixing instructions. There will be a little chart or table on there that will have like, uh, there's usually three categories. You know, the two of them like flowable and fluid mix. Tells you how much water to mix in with it per bag. It will give you the strength at different days. Uh, so keep that in mind. Uh, if it's not on the bag, you just need to get it off the uh, manufacturer's website. There should be a, uh, a product sheet on there that lists all that information. Because it's critical we know that. because. <coughs> We want a pretty fluid mix, you know, to get down in this keyway to make sure we fill all that void. We don't want to put a stiff mix in there and leave voids behind. But to do that, we need to make sure we got that 5,000 psi. So, and we only want to use good, clean pot of water, no creek water. You know, contractor, he's going to take the easy way out. He's got a pump. He wants to throw that thing in the creek and get it easy. We need to make sure we get good, clean water. The quantity of water, like I was telling you about. It's not, do we think it's a good idea if he just throws two bags of non-shrink grout mix into his, in his mixer, he gets his hose from his water tank, just throws it in there, he's just standing around talking to his buddy while he's mixing that up, oh, that looks like enough water, and starts pouring it out. Does that, anybody think that's a good idea? No. 
When you do that, we do not know what strength we're getting in that ground. We have no idea. So don't use it looks right method, or that's how we pour it all. We always do it. Just guess at it. It needs to be measured. That's the only way. Measure the water that we put in per bag. That's the only way we know we're getting that, that right consistency to get the strength that we're looking for in three days. Because once the grout goes in these keyways, it's next to impossible to take it out. So if you get wheat grout in there, we've got a problem. I mean, that keyway, it's narrow at the top, then it widens out, and then it narrows back down. There is, I don't know of any way that you're going to get that grout out of there to get that keyway to function like it's supposed to. So make sure we get the mix that we're looking for. Uh, once the, the, you got the right mix, we talked about mixing. Now we need to pre-wet the area. We've got dry, a dry cured concrete beans. They're going to absorb and soak up that moisture. So we need to pre-wet them before we grout. We need to use backer rod. Or the word I don't like, spray foam. I don't like to see that on any project. I know it's out there all the time. But uh, we do allow it with some exceptions. But uh, to me, uh, I just do not like that stuff because it's, uh, it can cause more problems than it can help. If we do things right, you know, I know you all see it on your form works. I call it carpenter in a can. We can't measure and cut our angles right, form things up, get it to fit right. We'll just fill it up with foam. So, you know, it's, it's, it's never good, but uh, it can be used if used properly. Here's the backer rod. <coughs> Excuse me. Here, to me, this picture here looks like he's kind of <coughs> laying on the top. Looks like it needs to be pushed down in that <coughs> section a little bit. Uh, here's what I'm talking about. You may see anything wrong with that picture. Right. If anybody's ever used that spray foam at your house, great stuff. It's a similar type product. It expands. You cannot control. You know, depending on how much you put there, the confined spaces, it's going to expand. So, if you're going to allow your contractor to use this, or he wants to use this, before he starts, I recommend you have a conversation with him that this will not be allowed. If he does this, he's going to have to get him a piece of rebar or some type of a pry bar or something that he can get fit down in that groove, sharpen that edge on it, and scrape this stuff away, blow it out. <clears throat> because what we've got here, we're supposed to have 5,000 PSI ground in three days. Now we've just replaced it with foam that if we're lucky, have one or two PSI. So just up front, have that conversation with him. If he wants to use it, just, just let him know the expectations that he's going to get that ground out of that keyway that, that rises up too much. So uh, I've seen it. Uh, I had arguments with the contractor over it, you know, but uh, that's that's not what we're looking for. So um, it's better if they'll use backer rod, but some of them insist on the spray foam. Yes, sir. I've seen it both ways. And one contractor has a, uh, it's like an extension, a metal extension, four inch, it actually falls down into the crack. Yes. So when he sprays it, it stays down it there. It stays yes. down low. It's not like it. it's a real neat job. Right. And they also make, they make different types of this spray foam. They make some that's, uh, I forget the exact terminology, but it, the expansion rate is less than others. But they make some that don't, they don't grow and, and swell on you as bad as others. But the, the key is they just, it works and it's, it's fine if they do it properly. You've got to apply it right. You've got to apply it right, the right amount. But if, if, if they're not careful, they'll end up with this, and that's what we do not want. And then with the back rod, if you're not careful, you push it out of time. You can't. If it's too loose or whatever, you know, you need to make sure you get the right size back rod for the, the size opening that you have. All right. Here's just another couple slides of showing the installing the back rod. Um, all right. We're going to place the grout. The big thing here, we need to strike this grout off flush. We need to, because uh, like I said, we got an overlay of some type coming on top of this. Uh, we need to make sure we're not mixing up the grout too much at a time. This stuff will set up fairly quick on you because it's high strength. Uh, <coughs> here, I don't recommend this method. Just dumping it out of the wheelbarrow. You can see what kind of mess he's making here. Most contractors build them a little small trough with a slot in the bottom. 
they can drag it down along that top of that keyway. That's a whole lot better method. It does not make near the mess because one thing here, uh, if you read your plan notes, there's a note on these box beams, porch slabs that says that the uh, the top surface of these should have a raked finish. So if we spec that, we want a raked finish because we want that texture rub for the bonding our uh, our wearing surface onto the top of it. What do we think we're doing right here? Yeah, look, look where we finished. We've got maybe six, eight inches at best that's got that rake finish. We've filled in the rest of it smooth. So <clears throat> keep that in mind that uh, they'll need to come back and clean this. And they'll have to do it fairly quick. The, the best thing is don't make a mess when you do it the first time. Then you don't have to worry about it. But uh, So just same thing with spray foam. Let your contractor know we don't want that grout smeared all over and filling in a rake finish. That we need to attempt to do a good, neat job, not just dumping it out there and spreading it around. <clears throat> all right. We also have to fill our dial holes on these bridges. So we've got two different methods of that. So you need to be aware of this. We've got, uh, just like a poured deck bridge, we've got expansion in and we've got fixed ends that are bent. So it's, it's going to vary just depending on the how the designer designed the bridges, how many spans you got, what the length is. Look at your plans. Uh, on your expansion end, there should be a note that tells you put a uh, joint sealer an inch and a half above your dial bars. Then, then top it off with the grout above it. Your, your fixed bits, they will be filled completely with grout. But if you think about it, is an expansion end. That's the end we want to move. So if we grout that core hole up, mm -hmm. that dowel bar in, fill it solid with grout, where's it going to move? We just locked it in. So I have seen a set of plans that the notes was left off on the expansion end. Just keep that in mind. If you've got an expansion, we need to put that joint sealer above, an inch and a half above that dowel, and then top it off because we need to leave that movement because the bridge is going to move. You know, something's going to give. You know, we're going to be shearing off dowels, you know, busting concrete. Something's going to move, so keep that in mind. Pushing the approach slab, separating it from pavement, so um, we just need to make sure we get that uh, done correctly so we don't have long-term damage. We need to sample these. Four by eight cylinders. Uh, years ago, we never, we never tested uh, prepackaged grout. But we do need to, as required to sample this now, make you four bait cylinders. Um, it kind of varies from office to office. I always like to make a three day break. And I think you still require that 28 day break, you know, for the official testing. But if, if you don't test it in three days, you don't know that it met our specs. So that's kind of something that's not exactly right in our specs. It's, you know, uh, but, uh, it probably needs to be looked at changing to get that more clarified for you. But I always make an extra set of cylinders so I can break it in three days. Um, you know, I know it's tough sometimes to get these cylinders to the lab in three days, but we need to do the best we can. I mean, it's not the end of the world if it's four days and you know have them break it that same day. You know, the goal is we're looking for that strength in early, and we do need to make sure the contractor does not get on the uh, the slabs until we until we get that strength. So. <clears throat> These bridges are no different than a poor deck. You know, we need our strength requirements before we get out there. If we're going to place any heavy loads on that deck, we need to run it by the structures management with the submittal. Now, if, if you're going to, you know, if you got your approach slabs done and you're going to drive a pickup truck or a rubber tire backhoe across it, we're not going to worry about it. Um, if you're going to put a crane out there to set your center span over the creek, we need a submittal. It needs to go to Raleigh with all the the crane loads, the, the loads of the span that you're going to set, what type of crane mats you're going to set out there on that span, the location of those outriggers. All that needs to be detailed, sent to Raleigh approval before you lay a crane on the bridge. Now, I also like to tell the guys I work with, you know, we put sidewalks and all kinds of things on these bridges now. Contractor may want to uh, walk a large excavator out there, bucket that concrete on the sidewalk for some reason, uh, or, or, you know, lifting some, some crane mats or putting some uh, if we start getting something that's pretty large, you need to need to talk. We might need to think about a submittal. Talk with your resident, your BCE, uh, before we do that. Uh, 
just to make sure you know, we went all these steps so far today to making sure we get a good bridge. We don't want to damage it by putting a, a heavy load on there that we don't know how it's going to affect that structure. So just keep that in mind. But you know, your pickups, your small backhoes, there's not an issue there putting those across them once we get that strength on our ground. All right. Here's something to look for. Anybody seen that before? That cracking outside the uh, shear key. All right. Part of that problem could be did we have 100% bearing on the outside of this elastomeric pad? We come in here, put that extra weight of that uh, barrier wall on there. Now we've got 100% bearing. Well, what it did, it just cracked up keyway. You know, if it's going to move, something's got to give. So <clears throat> that's something we need to keep in mind. Did we do our post tension right? Did we get our, our bear pads to get fully engaged? Um, here on the left side, you also see this uh, in your asphalt wearing surfaces. Typically, if you come back on a 12-month warranty, if, if you've got traffic you put on the asphalt during the life of the job, you know, before you're done, still working on the approaches or something, uh, You'll see a crack come across. It'll follow your bent lines, your end bends. It's just the nature of these bridges. Uh, a lot of them do not have any expansion joints in them. So we still know these beams are, the camber deflections are going up and down. And so it's going to crack. You will see that the longer the span, the quicker it'll crack and the bigger it'll crack. So uh, the, that is typical to see.